go, okay. So, hello and welcome to tonight's Bitcoin Munich Communities Online Meetup. Today happens to be the 21st day of the 21st year of the 21st century. And every 21st of a month, we do the Satoshi's 21 workshop seminar type format. And we're always looking for good presenters and other contributors. So don't hesitate to approach us. Our audience is usually a good mix of experienced Bitcoiners as well as more general audience with a good background in tech finance and other fields. And of course, we always have uh, newcomers also. So um, for those of you who are new, welcome. Um, today, this is not a 101, but we hope you still can get an impression and overview and can pick up some things. Um, this format is inspired by the Socratic seminar that many Bitcoin developer groups over the globe use. We're doing this a bit lighter tonight, hoping to make it a little bit more generally accessible. Um, the Socratic method also means that you can ask dumb questions and pretend you do it only basically for rhetoric reasons and to get more out of the discussion. So don't be shy to ask questions. Um, usually there's also the Chatham house rule, which means that privacy and confidentiality, confidentiality is important. In that after the meeting, you can feel free to spread the word about what was talked about, but not by whom. Um, so obviously we are streaming this, so things are a bit relaxed concerning that, but please still try to respect this. And also we we'll switch off the stream near the end for the opportunity for a bit more off the record discussions here in Chitsi before we finish up for good. Um, so another thing, we are here on the Chitsi conference server of Rifeung Munich gonna show it here. Um, so this is um, this is great infrastructure that they set up that can be used by anyone. It's easy and free as in beer and free as in speech for non-commercial use. So consider checking it out for yourself and donate to them or join them and help, help build open infrastructure. So before we start, if you want to introduce yourself on the record and for the stream, um, especially if you want to contribute to the discussion later, then please do so now. Okay, nobody then Maybe you can, of course, also ask questions in the chat and we may pick them up. Okay, as always, we've invited knowledgeable Bitcoiners as seminar instructors. So I hand over to MC and Sebastian. May you introduce yourselves a bit and then let's go. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Sebastian. I'm a long time Bitcoin enthusiast and advocate since uh, 2013, I think. Uh, I always heard it was some sort of really important thing, big revolution. Um, at the moment, it seems like it's become true. Yeah, Bitcoin is discussed as a world reserve currency. It has some institutional adoption. Um, but still, I'd like to focus on the technical parts. Um, I'm, I'm a physicist, um, but that's my background. I work as a software developer. Um, so I also like to look at the technology side of things. To, um, and now I hand over to MZ for his introduction. After that, I kick off. Yeah, um, hello. <clears throat> I'm MZ. Um, I studied electrical engineering. That's like my background. But I normally do um, IT stuff like firewalling and sysadmin stuff, like running servers and, uh, and so on. And I increasingly do that also for, for Bitcoin or in the Bitcoin realm. Let's say, uh, for example, I have a um, mempool.space explorer running myself that's uh, open uh, for everyone and running an Electrum server and also some servers for, for the BISC network. Um, BISC is a decentralized 
uh, exchange, a fully decentralized exchange where you can buy Bitcoin and other stuff. Um, yeah, and it's mostly so I'm more, more the sysadmin kind, and but I'm, I'm also trying to get more into how the software really works, how how, how Lightning Network and Bitcoin works. Uh, yeah, but I'm not directly a software developer, so <laughs> yeah. Okay, great, thank you. So I, I'd like to kick things off. Um, I think the main topic for today is like a um, view on 2020, on the last year, conclusion of last year. Um, what went down in Bitcoin. And first, I'd like to start with a look at the numbers. So network statistics and numbers. First slide, um, we have an overview of the nodes we have at the moment. And I want to um, take a look at the at the development of these numbers, um, which we have here. So start of last year was basically here. So um, we have uh, the Full nodes, which are which are listening nodes, which are basically um, returning requests for connection. You can connect to them. Um, they they are pretty much at about slightly below ten thousand or so. Um, these are the ones. These are the the tricky ones. So if you have one at home, you have to set up your router, so it can you have to route through and the port from the outside. And not everyone does that. Most people are more like casual users. They just uh, install Bitcoin Core, and then it looks like this from the outside. They, are, they the nodes uh, suck up information from the outside, but they don't really share it. And here we have a nice peak towards the end of the year. I guess most of it was Umbrel. Umbrel was a really nice tool um, to set up your own full node with just a few clicks. And we saw a big increase here. Very nice to see. Uh, next up, a uh, very important um, technical key figure, the uptime. The uptime of the whole Bitcoin network uh, is given on this page. It's 99.98% or even more that at the moment. So the last downtime is like eight, nine years ago. There, there were two kind of goof ups. Uh, one was an inflation bug and the other one was a chain split, I think, which had to be cleared up quickly, which each led to a downtime of just a few hours. Uh, in the end, everybody in networking knows this is an excellent statistic, very reliable network. But it's one of my pet peeves that it's a bit debatable what it actually means to have a downtime. <laughs> because, okay. because, I mean, nodes are reachable and, and there might be a reorg. But, I mean, when paper, when you use paper, it's, it, it may be reachable, you don't get a 503, so it's uptime 100%. But maybe they have a problem with the database in the back end, and maybe they, you get an email that uh, maybe check your data, something that it, it's still everything is okay. Uh, I think it's more compared to that and not, uh, but it's my opinion. I mean, you could have a different opinion. <laughs> yeah, this, I think, yeah, this is a bit tongue in cheek. I mean, this is not really a, uh, a uh, network, correct? It's tongue in cheek. And you can define uptime in a way, time in which a, trans a transaction you post would be accepted for good forever. Yeah. They were like two time intervals of six and eight hours uh, quite a few years ago. Yeah, those transactions are the kind of being rolled back. Yeah, but we, you know, we had a, today also uh, some kind of trauma. <laughs> But you have to yeah, wait for you have to wait for the confirmations anyway. So yeah, yeah, that's true. But yeah, I mean, if you have an eight-hour interval, you could have your six confirmations and still see your transaction kicked out later. So that's kind of that's the difference, I guess. But yeah, yeah but it's in the mempool, and eventually, it. I mean, it it, it just changes its con its status from n confirmations back to unconfirmed, and then again to one confirmation. So yeah. Oh, yeah, it can, it can yeah. be the transaction can be attacked again, and that little short time window. But but yeah, I mean, it, but it's yeah. not not a five or three. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> My good, point anyway. Good point. I didn't see it. Yeah, in this case, your transaction didn't really get kicked out. It just got pushed back into the mempool, and then uh, it was had a chance to get later validated in the next block. Yeah, good point. Um, next up, um, we have the size of the mempool. So that is. As everyone knows, that knows, there's not one mempool, but there's a, each node has a mempool, which is like a, a pool of unconfirmed transactions. And when things get busy on the network, there's, there's quite a backlog. Yeah, we can see um, sometimes in November, for example, 
um, when the mempool transaction count reached about 140,000, uh, which is pretty massive. Yeah, putting these numbers into perspective, you can fit about 4,000 transactions into a block. Um, so if you divide 140,000 by 4,000, you get uh, something like 35. Uh, so that's six hours of blocks. So even if no one posted any new transactions, it would uh, take six hours to clear the backlog, which means yeah, a, a lot of time waiting unless you are prepared to attach some hefty fees. I think the violet color is like a thousand Satoshi per byte, uh, which is just extreme. So we had some some short periods of network congestions, but usually uh, stuff cleared out over the weekend. Still, I think it's it's quite healthy. There's some discussion to it, but I think the general consensus is that you need uh, a fee market. Yeah. So the place in the block has to be a, an economic scarce resource uh, where people are bidding for. Um, otherwise, it would endanger the safety of the network uh, when the mining subsidy runs out later. Uh, any questions about this to the audience? Uh, you're always encouraged to just interrupt me or ask questions, OK? I read that the mempool hasn't been clearing the past few weeks. Um, can you confirm that or can you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely sure. You can, as I said, usually it clears over the weekend, but uh, here you can see on from January, this graph doesn't go to zero. Yeah, so it's actually true. There are some some confirmations sitting here, and uh, the dump pool didn't clear get get cleared out for the last weeks. But there is an additional thing that happens. Um, a default mempool on a node will be only three hundred megabytes. And if you go on the on the on the default mempool, then you will also see that the that the small transaction, uh, the, the the cheap transaction for one satoshi per virtual byte, uh, will also be uh, every uh, deleted out of the mempool. Yeah, which is also which is also bad. Yeah, but what can we do about this? Increase the standard size of the mempool on the nodes, or no? <laughs> no, why not? Um, Try to do it short. So, so if you have a big mempool, that is also slowing down your machine. So, so the mempool, as it states, is in the memory. So even, even uh, it, it stays in memory. And if you have a bigger one, then your node needs more memory and also more computing power because uh, including a new transaction into the mempool will, will first check if it's not already already there and other stuff. So there. Making it bit bigger, bigger should be only maybe interesting for miners or for pools mm -hmm. to have the transactions still. Uh, but uh, normally on your node, uh, for for example, the Raspberry Plits and other small nodes running on a Raspberry Pi, they they have changed it down to like 100 or 150 megabytes. So bec because the machine is so slow and a bigger mempool makes problems. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Sure. <laughs> Okay, next graph, Bitcoin hash rate. We saw a real explosion in hash rate um, this year. I mean, okay, now the explosion started earlier uh, uh, during the last bull cycle three years ago, but also this year, starting here, we had, we had quite a nice increase. I think uh, current hash rate is, I think it's 140 exa hash. That's correct, yeah, exa hash. So 10 to the 18, times 133 exa hash, which is absolutely mind boggling. Yeah, we have a lot of specialized hardware doing this. Um, yeah, so I mean, this is the normal cycle. Price rises, um, hash rate rises, and also uh, new generations of miners being rolled out with smaller process nodes um, running, running more hashes at the same time for maybe even less energy. Another nice metric to watch is uh, the number of contributions uh, to the Bitcoin core repo. So um, the, the source code which the uh, Bitcoin node gets built. Um, we have a real new all-time high in 2020 here uh, in contributions, um, which is also very nice to see. Here we have the, the high scoreboard of the main contributors. Uh, some are real heroes, uh, Vladimir. And uh, Peter, and yeah, I think it's further down here. We also have some kind of 
going on John and Beth. Really cool what they are doing. Um, uh, the last slide I was going to show, it's, it is, was about the number of ATMs. Unfortunately, I have some sort of next screen on here, which I can't get rid of unless I sign up for some sort of stuff. So, but uh, it's, uh, it's safe to say that uh, Bitcoin ATM number also went up worldwide. Okay, that was my first part. <laughs> now I hand over to MZ, I think. Okay, let me share my screen. Sadly to say that uh, that in Germany the ATMs are getting less, so <laughs> less ATMs now. Yeah, because but, of legislation, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. It's strange. Okay, so uh, I, I will uh, firstly do a few uh, topics that are not directly technical or just about uh, the ecosystem or maybe maybe price. I'm not sure, no, I think not directly price. Uh, it's about price. Okay, the first one is um, the, the third halving was uh, 2020. Uh, halving is every, roughly every every four years, uh, the block substitute. That is what, what the, the miner additionally gets if he mines a block, uh, was again halved. So we had, the first halving sometime back from 50 to 25 bitcoins every new block. Then it was uh, 12, 12 and a half, and now we are at uh, uh, 25 and then 12 and a half, and then 6.25. I'm right, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we now, now we know that the price was heavily going up. <laughs> but um, uh, this news article uh, is about that the price pretty much ha had not changed at all or j just no normal up and downs that you always see. Um, uh, but as I remember, the other halvings, it was pretty much the same. So normally, um, if the miners are less selling their Bitcoins, um, there, there's some... Mostly it's like half a year or so that it takes until you see the halving event in, in some price action or so. And I think this time, again, it played like out like, like, like textbook. <laughs> it's exactly like half a year and the price <clears throat> goes up. Yeah. But I thought the halving is priced in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, a good, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, I mean... Normally it should, normally it should, yeah. But uh, as you see, it's not priced in. I don't know if that ever changes. Um, somehow it's not priced in, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a bit of obvious that, uh, I mean, the more you go into the future, the more the uncertainty factor uh, comes in again. So, I, I mean, you, you can't, I mean, even if you look at this stock to flow model um, that that uh, predicts the Bitcoin price will be, uh, I don't know, sometime at 100,000. Um, it can be now at 100,000 because uh, there's still it's uh, there's still uncertainty along the way, and you can't factor this out from the from the pricing in. So that's my opinion. So yeah, yeah, discussion, so. yeah, I think yeah, I think a few people uh, saying saying this that um, that not only uh, it's not priced in or it maybe it will be uh, it it is already priced in but it's also priced in that the uncertainty is much higher in the beginning and uh, as we see right now the uncertainty that Bitcoin will survive uh, for a longer time uh, goes down all the time like every every day it goes down a little bit so. Um, Maybe that's that also contributes to the to the to the price action. Whatever price, price, price. Yeah. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> um, yeah, PayPal announced back then that they will uh, put Bitcoin in their PayPal app, and you can buy and sell Bitcoin on the app, and it's out. So in the US, you already can do that. Uh, they said that in Europe or in the rest of the world, it will come 
in the first qu quarter this year. So must be around the corner. Uh, I, I'm totally amazed. I, I can't. I can't. <laughs> Can't say how oh, amazed I'm. Um, so, so I'm I'm a little bit longer in, in, into Bitcoin, and in, in the beginning, you 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 couldn't dream that PayPal will integrate Bitcoin. Uh, that's like totally crazy. But uh, what they're right now doing only is like you can buy in the app. I I, I didn't saw it, but I think you can. You uh, as as are uh, reading about it, uh, it's. Uh, you just can buy Bitcoin there and you can sell Bitcoin there, but you can't send or receive Bitcoin on the app. So, but it seems that they, that's maybe coming. What's what's uh, what's what will come? What the C uh, CEO said is um, that you can use your Bitcoin balance to pay on every merchant that uh, supports PayPal. So that will be the next. I think that's. Or not rolled out right now. I'm not hundred percent sure, but uh, that that will come, I, th I think. And if you ever can send and receive Bitcoin there, I hope, I hope. But uh, nevertheless, it's it's totally amazing. But uh, if if somebody asks you, uh, I, I want to buy ten Bitcoins and just try tr try how it feels to have Bitcoin, not really using it, okay? <laughs> but uh, you can use PayPal, and I think that's a that, that's a super cool thing for people to try how it feels to have Bitcoin, oh, uh, even if you can't really access it. Yeah. You can still use number up technology, yeah. You exactly. Exploded to the price. <laughs> That part is working, yeah. 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 Any other comments? Okay, then we go to the next one. Um, there was, uh, we know the virus is going around, and in back, uh, back in 2020, the pandemic really started, and pretty much everything was crashing. Um, this article is about that, that it's going uh, was going down to four, about four thousand dollars Bitcoin, and also all the other stuff. Tether was even up. I see. Oh, one cent up, one percent. Amazing. What gains? No, oh, 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 I'm joking. <laughs> okay, uh, pretty much all was down, um, and I will only show this. Uh, this is the gold price in the, in, in, in the time frame here around this time, and it was also down. So everything was going down, not only Bitcoin and all cryptocurrency crap. Uh, uh, all everything was going down. Mm -hmm. That is liquid, and so, so I think it's it's called a li liquidity event. So that, like, for example, I try to explain it so as I as I understand it. So if if you are long on something like a stock, for example, in your in your trading account, then uh, and the stock goes down, or also stocks were going down like crazy. Um, if you want to have that long open, if it's leveraged, let's say it's leveraged two, three times, whatever, and the stock is going down like crazy, then you need to put additional dollars on your account to get not liquidated. That's the thing. So, and then you you have to figure out where to get the dollars. And normally you just sell what is most liquid. Because if you're trying to sell something like a house, for example, that firstly took uh, take a long time, and secondly, it's not liquid. So if everybody tries to sell a house at that point, the price will plummet. plummet. So you, you're doing, you, you use something that is really liquid. And for me, it's only showing that Bitcoin is like the most liquid thing you can, you can use because uh, there's always somebody who is selling it, selling it to you um, or, or buying it, it from you, the other way around this, for that example. And um, yeah, so that's, that's my take. I, I'm, I, I'm not concerned about uh, that Bitcoin was going like, down like 40%. It only shows that it's, uh, that it's usable for it. It's 24-7 it's every day of the year, and you can sell it uh, wherever. So it's perfect. <laughs> I, I'm not concerned. And it was going up after it. So yeah. So it's clearly like ex exactly like gold going up after the liquidation, liquidity event. Any comments on that? 
more questions? Yeah, I think this is a nice explanation. So people were asking me during this, so so why, Sebastian, why, why is Bitcoin dumping? Yeah, you, you told us it's a hedge against crisis. Now we've got a crisis, yeah, and Bitcoin is dumping. What the heck is going on? Um, but I think it's really it's really the liquidity crisis. Yeah, people needed it because uh, they got margin calls for their leveraged uh, debts and everything was liquidated. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's safe yeah. against uh, against crisis for the long term. It's not yeah. like uh, short term, like next day or something. Uh, yeah, I, I exactly can, like, yeah. like gold. <laughs> you see it on the chart. It's exactly the same. So yeah. Yeah, right. When there is a hmm, Mad Max scenario, right? <laughs> then um, and you need your gold to buy some some canned food. Yeah. Then, that, then that means the gold price has crashed enormously. Um, and it's maybe not the best idea to use your gold, actually, because you really should, in such case, store that gold long term still and and try to liquidate other things or use yeah. other things like uh, fuel or whatever. So. Yeah, yeah. A, a friend of mine once told me, um, for this Mad Max scenario, the best is buying honey. Because honey, um, it, 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 it doesn't get bad. So you can store it like forever and you can sell it. Somebody will like, if they're hungry, they can eat honey. It's a good source for, 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 for energy. And if nobody buys it, you can eat it yourself. So it's like the perfect thing for your Mad Max scenario. By honey, <laughs> or, may, or maybe maybe coffee because you can't plant it here so easily. Yeah, yeah but the vodka, okay. If, if you're hungry, the coffee not not really a solution. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but first of all, coffee. But but first of all, you shouldn't uh, use Bitcoin in a Mad Max scenario because there you need internet. Huh? <laughs> and ask Andy <laughs> about how fragile internet can be. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, yeah, problems. Yeah. Look down exactly <laughs> to the start of this media. It's, it's, it's like somebody is listening in, but uh, okay. <laughs> yes, the deep state is interested in our actions, uh, so uh, we're doing something very it right. Could, huh? It could be. It could be. I don't know. It's it's stable like, not like nothing. But today, exactly at twelve uh, at eight p.m. Whatever. <laughs> okay. Um, next one is uh, Elon Musk was twittering. Oh, we already at December. I don't know if it's oh, whatever. It's uh, it was December, not lo long ago. He was uh, tweeting this picture, um, and then Michael Saylor, who uh, who is the the person who bought like with his company MicroStrategy, like super bunch of Bitcoin. Uh, I think it was 70,000 Bitcoins or something he has now. So he bought like for millions, hundreds of millions uh, Bitcoins. And he was answering that uh, Tesla should do the same and uh, making something that would be amazing for, for their, their stockholders. <laughs> uh, and then Elon was asking if, if it's possible to buy like 100 billions of, uh, of, of Bitcoins. And I think Ma uh, Michael Saylor was answering something. Uh, there is, it is. Yes, I have purchased over 1.3 billion in Bitcoins uh, last month and, <laughs> and would like to share uh, my playbook with you offline from one rocket scientist to, to another. I don't know if he's a rocket scientist, but uh, yeah, sure. After that, uh, nothing more. But uh, it so so now the rumors are that Elon Musk is buying Bitcoin. I don't know. <laughs> uh, also, I'm not sure if I should care. Uh, and even if he's buying, why? Uh, if he's privately buying, why? Why should he tell somebody? Why? Makes no sense. So I think uh, Elon Musk is a smart guy, and uh, he will not talk about his. It's personal bitcoins, I think. So if the company buys Bitcoin, I'm personally also thinking no, because he's 
he's like an inventor and he wants to build new amazing stuff and needs the money all the time for, for building stuff and not hodling it and uh, let it laying around. Uh, so I don't know. Other opinions? <laughs> Oh, you are agreeing, I see. <laughs> I mean, it does have a effect um, if a CEO of a publicly traded company um, makes a testimonial for Bitcoin like that. I mean, I think first he adopted it as a reserve asset for his company. Later on, he even borrowed money to buy even more. I mean, this gives a lot, a lot of legitimation, legitimization for Bitcoin. Yeah, Michael Saylor, uh, right, yeah. For, for Michael Saylor, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he made the decision to become this public spokesperson um, that's uh, evangelist for Bitcoin now. And um, yeah, so uh, obviously um, going going ahead and, and speaking a lot about it, uh, I think there was not a single podcast he hasn't, uh, uh, he hasn't talked on uh, to this day. And he, he still keeps on going, doing shows on YouTube and stuff, being very vocal about it. And uh, by doing that, um, yeah, creating more trust for Bitcoin, creating more awareness for it, and uh, pushing his own investment um, by that. So it makes a lot of sense to, yeah. to do what he's doing, uh, from a, just a, from an economic perspective, uh, to protect his investment and to, to even push it further. And maybe if Elon Musk should decide to to dabble in it uh, as well, I think if he did it for Tesla, he would have to be open about it um, because it's a publicly traded company and he yeah, needs yeah. to take care of, of shareholder uh, and be transparent about it. Um, but yeah, I, I have no clue and uh, if, if he does or not. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's nice. It's nice yellow press and better than uh, some other topics that are um, uh, regularly coming and going uh, in the Bitcoin scene. <laughs> yeah. Just to slightly repeat my my my, my point is like uh, for Michael Saylor and his his company MicroStrategy is. I have the feeling it's not like an, a company that is right now really innovating and stuff. He has some product he's selling. He has cash laying around and have no idea what to do with the cash because he he's not doing something new. He doesn't need the cash to for his company. And and he he is in software, developing software. Uh, there is not an immense uh, cash needed to to uh, doing something in software. And Elon Musk is. is building cars and build, building spaceships. And uh, there you need money for all this stuff to build. And uh, so um, I think Elon will just put all the money from his company in the next project, project he says, B building even bigger rockets, building even faster cars. Uh, so uh, I, I I just be don't believe that uh, it's happening. But. But uh, that this is out there and people see this, uh, I think it's, it's amazing. I, I have the feeling Elon uh, Musk is a little bit trolling more than maybe serious, but uh, you never know. <laughs> okay, going to the next one. Um, we are already going to that or um, Stefan, uh, you also have something. Uh. Are you talking to me? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm just done, but yeah. It's a button, sorry. <laughs> um, I, th I think we can go to this part and do optic afterwards. Yeah. So please continue. Okay. So um, uh, the Bitcoin Magazine did some uh, list of the twenty-one, what else? Twenty-one most influential Bitcoin projects and companies of twenty twenty. And I'm glad that the first one is BISC because I'm. <laughs> uh, as I said before, it's a decentralized exchange and tries to be on and off ramp, uh, even if if you are in a country where where Bitcoin is illegal, then uh, it could be that the software just runs on your computer and you can use it. Possible. Try it out. Um, 
Blue Wallet is a wallet. Um, uh, I'm not sure. Is it iOS only? Uh, I think they also have a here. It's, no, it's both. Only, yeah. Sorry. I think I saw it's both that. Android and iOS. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, they only talking about the iOS version, but okay, it's also on uh, on, on Android as I hear. Um, yeah, it's an amazing wallet. It, uh, it's an on-chain wallet. One part is an on-chain wallet that is, has has included like uh, uh, built so much features in. For example, they they built in some uh, pay join feature and. Uh, you can use several hardware wallets with it, and it's it's a really nicely good made wallet, yeah. And it also has a Lightning part. Sadly, that's it's, a, it's that's uh, custodial, so the Bitcoin will be held uh, from from the from the company, so not 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 your keys on on the wallet, but uh, the Lightning wallet works also fine. Just a caveat that you don't have. Um, the keys for the lightning part. BTC Pay Server, that's, uh, if there are any questions or any, just jump in. Um, BTC Pay Server, that's a, an awesome software to run on a web server and receive payments. That's like, uh, if, if you know PayPal, many people know that, uh, you have like a screen where you see what's your paying tool uh, what you're paying, and then you can uh, uh, choose something. And this is basically that. You can build it in other websites and have a payment pop up and uh, pay on chain and also via via Lightning. And it's really well well made and uh, um, also can do pay join. Maybe we we explain later what pay join is, but I um, really like it. And yeah, it's an awesome software. If you if you want to receive um, Bitcoin payments, it's it's awesome. It also uh, supports some other coins, I think. But uh, yeah, awesome product for that. Um, Coincar Coincide is the company, and Coldcard is one of their products. Um, it's an awesome um, hardware wallet. It's really well made and. Uh, uh, yeah, I would say like state of the art right now because it has a secure element and also all the other stuff except the secure element is open source and the secure element is only used for for some of the key stuff and nothing else. Um, and it's Bitcoin only. It's there is no other coin that it works with. Fold is an app on an uh, on a, on a phone, but I think it's US only, and uh, uh, the category is sets back that says uh, you get uh, you can use that app to buy something somewhere and get uh, get some satoshis back for buying something. Yeah, <laughs> never tried it myself. Uh, yeah, it's it's a debit card I see. Yeah, like a credit card, debit card. US, many people use that. Um, okay, Hodl Hodl is also a uh, decentralized exchange, uh, a little bit less decentralized, but uh, don't get into <laughs> things. It's an uh, also amazing. It's it's running completely in the browser, but uh, um, it doesn't hold your keys, so um, you own your Bitcoin all the time. And it's also KYC free, exactly like uh, like this. So there's no KYC. KYC is uh, know your customer, so you don't need picture of yourself or your passport or last whatever. It simply works. Uh, the Human Rights Foundation, I'm really amazed. <laughs> it's a nonprofit organization and they, uh, Support many Bitcoin projects. Uh, yeah, so you can uh, spend, uh, you can donate money to money to them, and they will distribute it to some good cause. Um, Lightning Labs. That's the, the yeah. 
Sorry. Uh, the quality, the quality of the grants that Human Rights Foundation has facilitated, is really um, exceptionally good in my opinion, especially their last picks. Um, so they they have a deep knowledge of the ecosystem and the developers, the open mostly open source developers that they are supporting. Um, I think in the last grants were Ben Kaufman, who's working on the crypto advanced Spectre wallet. And uh, the other one, I think, was uh, Mesh um, Network, uh, Lot49. And um, yeah, it shows really uh, um, deep knowledge and understanding of the ecosystem and the developers that are in need of support. Uh, I think before that was Chris Belcher's CoinSwap pr protocol that he's working on. So, so exceptionally good picks, in my opinion. And um, yeah, yeah, really, really great. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay, the next one, Lightning Labs. That's the company uh, behind the LND Lightning Node and also some other parts that uh, like, I think they, they mentioned here the Lightning Pool. That's something where you um, can uh, earn money if you, um, if you open channels to others that need uh, incoming liquidity on, uh, on, on, on a channel, uh, that's an awesome product. Yeah. And there is the micro strategy. That's the company from uh, Michael Saylor. We talked already about it. And there are also the, I'm not sure if that's, uh, if the number is still right. It says here 450 million. They put into BTC at an average price of uh, yeah of uh, eleven thousand uh, dollars, and I'm pretty sure that uh, they increased that by nearly doubling it with some stunt where they um, put out uh, how is it called? So you could could invest in in some you can lend money to the company and the, 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 the money was used to buy more Bitcoins. So it's like, a, <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think it's a little bit crazy, but yeah, it works because the company can, uh, the, the interest can be paid from the, from the revenue of the company of MicroStrategy and uh, on the loan. And the loan is just used to buy Bitcoin. <laughs> It's, uh, I, I, I can't, can't believe the guy. <laughs> um, it's like hacking the, the fiat system. Yeah. And uh, I think he's uh, up immense. You see, he bought like 11, uh, 450 million for $11,000. And uh, what's the price right now? I don't know, over 30, 30 so three times. Okay. <laughs> nice. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I think we saw the figure about one dot something uh, billion he has. So that it, somehow uh, goes together with the number. Okay, next one. Uh, my note. It's a really nice, nicely made um, software you can run on a Raspberry Pi. I think you also can order the whole product and just plug it in, and it will work. Um, River Financial, let me check, what was that? Oh, okay, they, they, they trust the company for high net uh, individuals uh, where you can buy over the counter Bitcoin or can auto DCA uh, dollar cost averaging into, it's for the rich guys, I don't know how it's. Samurai Wallet, that's uh, a wallet. This time I know it's only uh, on, on Android. Uh, it's a privacy, yeah, it's a privacy uh, wallet. So many, many privacy enhancing features. Um, yeah, like CoinJoin or PayJoin, but they always have other names for it. And I can't remember which, what the names, but basically they do. Patreon and CoinJoin and other stuff um, to get more privacy in your on-chain coins. Yeah, it's cool. 
slash pool that's i think one of the oldest or uh, maybe it's the oldest pool that yeah, is around. They, they, yeah. yeah they are the oldest they can claim that they have invented pools mining that is slash uh, yeah. slash concept and also uh, the stratum protocol that is used right now still there's a new one but uh, they they support a new one already uh, but it's stratum version two <laughs> so still same name of protocol um yeah spectra drop desktop we heard uh, that uh, they were supported from the uh from the human rights foundation um it, it's it's a cool uh, desktop uh, wallet that mostly or uh, that is could be good used with uh, with hardware wallet in uh, as multisig. So I think they pioneering a re really cool uh, graphical user interface to use hardware wallets in multisig, and they only need a Bitcoin node running and nothing else. So that's really good. Uh, yeah. Just have your Bitcoin core running and respect that this stuff. Okay. Uh, Things chat. That's uh, an app for desktop and mobile um, that uses the Lightning uh, network to chat. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer messaging. And it also has groups. And the la last really amazing addition is podcasting. So the father of podcasting, um, Adam. Oh, Adam Curry. Curry, yeah, Adam Curry. He is also involved, and he he tries to 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 yeah get get podcasting more decentralized uh, and have a decentralized. Uh, Podcast index where you can find the podcasts and have a have a have a new payment model to to pay for for podcasts and that's built in this things chat where you um, can choose to pay for example five satoshis every minute for listening on a podcast and then that simply runs in the background over the lightning network. I think it's a, an amazing idea and 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 really cool. And you also can, can if you're in the middle of the podcast, you can put out a called boost, where you're just sending for this minute or for this part of the podcast additional Satoshis. And then uh, yeah, the podcaster can see, oh, this is really interesting. People give me money for, 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 for this part. Um, it's really amazing. And get, getting, hopefully, uh, podcasts uh, more money and uh, uh, they need less advertisement to run. Um, okay, Square is um, yeah, it, it's it says category exchange, but it's more. It's it's an app where you can receive. I think it started as an app where you can receive and uh, and pay with credit cards or mostly receive. It's called Square. Funny thing, it's a it's a small hardware device that you put in your phone jack on 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 your mobile phone, and then it can read could read um, the mag magnetic stripe of your credit card. Okay, that's gone. It's mostly chip now, but uh, that's how they started. And uh, now they they have built in that you can buy Bitcoin and use Bitcoin in the app. Um, if I'm right, it's it's still US only, and I don't know if it's coming somewhere else. But um, as I as I hear, it's an amazing app, and the CEO is Chuck uh, Jack Dorsey, the same as Twitter, and he's uh, he's he's a Bitcoiner. And uh, that co company also bought uh, um, Square, also bought some. Um, some of their treasury was converted into Bitcoin, but smaller part than, than Michael Saylor's uh, micro strategy. Okay, Strike. That's a super amazing app where you can use 
your credit card or your bank account on the Lightning Network. <laughs> so uh, in the app, you 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 put put in um, your bank account, and that's uh, right now it's uh, US only, and it's it's starting. They starting like last week or two weeks ago. They they announced that it will start in Europe. I'm not sure if it's already started, but you can go on a waiting list. Yeah, yes, but but it's uh, the waiting list is open for Europe. So uh, and yeah, you put put in your bank account or your credit card, and then you can pay some something over Lightning. So you you're just using Lightning, but you're never touching Bitcoin. That's uh, it depends where you live uh, in the U.S. It's always a problem to use your Bitcoin to buying something, but because you have uh, uh, capital uh, gains. On everything, then mostly, and you have to have to write that down. And then if you, if you use dollars to pay, pay something uh, via Lightning, then uh, you don't have that. So that's an advantage. And also, it works the other way around. So you can receive on your bank account payments that somebody does over like uh, over Lightning. So somebody can pay Bitcoin over Lightning, and you receive dollars or euros on your bank account. So that's yeah, super amazing. Also, the third option is you're using your bank account, you're paying something on the, on the other side on uh, also on Strike, and then you send, for example, dollars, and the other side uh, receives euros on the bank account, and between there's Bitcoin, but you don't see it. So that's that, that's an app that nobody no, need to know that uh, that there is Bitcoin or Lightning Network involved. It just works. And it's much cheaper because, uh, as I stated, the, the Bitcoin to some local currency uh, market is liquid and always running 24 hours a day. And yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> okay, took a little bit, maybe showed a little bit fanboy that that's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't believe it. It's, uh, it's uh, I have to try that out there. Yeah. So uh, Surebits, that's um, okay. That's um, it says my my microphone. Okay, it's fine. Um, Surebits is a uh, is a protocol or company. I'm not sure company, company that uh, develops discrete lock contracts for Bitcoin. So you can put down some, yeah, it's it's Oracle based, so you can bet on something, on, on an outcome on something. Uh, I'm not sure, I think I'm, I haven't tried it. Some Somebody know more than me on that one? Uh, I haven't tried it either, but uh, it will be on the, on the January part of the object because it will be about discrete lock contracts and I'm going to mention them again. Okay, then <laughs> go back to that. Uh, Spawn Bitcoin. Um, that's a uh, US exchange. Sadly, again, it's US only. Um, um, right now, they only support buying Bitcoins. They also um, have this uh, DCA dollar cost averaging, what's uh, the best thing to, to get into Bitcoin. Um, and I think they work that you also can sell them there but uh, right now i think they only only you can only buy there but uh, as i heard it's an amazing product sadly i can't try it out because i'm in europe yeah yeah just us right yeah unchained capital um Okay, so somebody knows something about Unchained Capital? Actually, I'm planking right now. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it just says there, there's a financial services company and they focus solely on Bitcoin. Yeah? No, no fiat. They tell you how to keep your infrastructure safe, how to how to set up multi-sig in, um, in a company and stuff. I think that's what they do. They offer 
cash loans to long-term cryptocurrency holders in a secure, fast, and transparent manner, backed by our multi-signature cold storage custody solution. Did you read this from the company prospectus? No, from <laughs> LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it sounded like that, yeah. Yeah, I heard the name, yeah, but I had no really... No, you are completely right. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. that's why I think we figured it out. Yeah, yeah we got it figured out now. <laughs> okay, this one I know, uh, CK Snarks, the company, and they're doing the Wasabi wallet. And it's a desktop-only wallet, it's not for mobile where you can do coin joins. And I think it's really ma well made. Um, maybe you need to be a little bit technical to use it or understand a little bit uh, under the hood how, it's, how it works. I think they're working on a better user interface, but uh, I, I like it. I think it's uh, it, it works great and it's really private because um, they, they're using this, um, 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 neutrino protocol where uh, you not showing uh, to to their server to other servers what 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 you what's the addresses you hold. So uh, and the coin join is also using Tor on everything. So we're opening a Tor connection to their concentr uh, uh, to their server, uh, which coordinates coordinator. Which coordinates the the coin join, and uh, I think it's really well made. Yeah, yeah. I think we we stop here because uh, it's already long. Um, I mean, the rest is Bitcoin, Casa, Donor Labs, fully noted, Glassnode, um, Grayscale, Nodal, Raspi Blitz, and Umbral. And Nodal, Raspi Blitz, Umbral are also small. Computers or raspberries, uh, Raspberry Pis that you, that that's your full node and Lightning server. Okay, then I think we I give over to Sebastian. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. So next up, uh, the Bitcoin Optech newsletter or the, the year twenty twenty in review in the Bitcoin Optech. Yeah, we had we still had some uh, links about um, financial stuff. Do we want to do that before, or did you want to skip them? <laughs> uh, I think we can do them afterwards because now, yeah, I yeah, think okay. we'll do some technical stuff and then some financial stuff again. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> Let's mix it a bit. <laughs> yeah, sure. So I'm trying to scare my sh scare my sh share my screen. I was going to say. Okay, I was going to say Bitcoin Bitcoin Optech is a really cool uh, weekly newsletter. It's very technical. It's basically aimed at people working in the industry as the Bitcoin developers, and it gives overview of new features and bugs and stuff that needs your urgent attention and stuff that's also an outlook into the future. And they they also gave a short um, look back at 2020 and very technical term. I think you could make the font a bit larger. Yeah. Yeah. Or a trick is yeah. Okay. Like this. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I was going I was going to say uh, discrete lock context in January. Generally, <clears throat> um, we had the highlight of uh, DLCs or discrete lock contracts. Which is basically a protocol which enables you to make a bet between two parties, um, and it's linked to an oracle, and uh, you have an automatic payout um, according to the outcome. Uh, the oracle doesn't know, doesn't necessarily have to know it's part of this, so it kind of reduces the attack surface. Um, I think we just uh, mentioned bit uh, short bits. These are the guys, short bits, they kind of uh, offer this. And uh, yeah, also we have um, two uh, kind of well known developers, um, Nicola and uh, Chris Stewart, uh, actually doing this, uh, putting uh, a bet of one Bitcoin on the presidential election in the US. So actually, 
This is implemented on mainnet. Everybody can use it uh, to settle their bets with friends. I think it's a really cool feature. Yeah, so did they solve the Oracle problem, or what is this useful for? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's kind of difficult to say what's this useful for. I mean, first of all, it's a protocol, yeah? You can uh, you can put your funds in there, and you don't really have to, have to trust the counterparty, because it will be executed automatically in a way. So that's, that's one thing, to formalize this in a protocol. Um, this, this Oracle, <clears throat> I'm not really sure. So the Oracle basically uh, publishes commitment, yeah, which is a which is a cryptographic trick. It doesn't really the outcome, but it it publishes commitment of the outcome, and so you have kind of some sort of trustless automatization of this. Or, or do you want to elaborate further on this? No. Um, you know. No, okay, okay. I thought I thought maybe you had some some ideas. Um, okay, let's leave it at that. Um, for February, and we had an important update on the Lightning specification. I mean, it, it was a self-imposed limitation. Before that, you could put uh, maximum channel size was uh, one point zero point one six uh, Bitcoin, which was not too much at the time, and also the maximum. Payment over channel was a, a quarter of that. So this was basically self-imposed uh, channel limit. The developers want to make sure people don't go too crazy on beta or even alpha software. And this was lifted. Yeah, this new feature was called Rumble Channels. You can still, both parties have to agree that you want to open a, a Rumble channel. Um, but now it's possible in the protocol to have uh, virtually unlimited sizes of um, Bitcoin Lightning channels and Lightning transactions. So one early problem was also that um, channels were also always funded by a single party. Uh, for example, if you're a merchant, you open a channel, uh, all the liquidity in it belongs to you. You cannot accept incoming payments. Uh, you have to make an outbound payment or rebalance the channels, uh, which is kind of kind of annoying. Yeah, you always see merchants asking for people opening channels with them for extra liquidity. And uh, to solve this problem, a new protocol <clears throat> enhancement was proposed by um, proposed by Lisa Mygood of, uh, I think she's Blockstream. It wouldn't make sense if she was Lightning Labs, but I think she's Blockstream. Uh, it's it's for dual funding, so basically both parties can kind of negotiate um, a, sh a channel where parts of the funds belong to each party, and still make this trustless. So this was a was a cool new feature which has been worked on. It's kind of kind of tricky, but uh, yeah, it looks like it's been uh, rolled out. Any comments or questions about Lightning in February? Nope. Okay. So going on to March, um, we had very big and long discussed, um, the new Taproot feature, um, which is merged uh, to the main sources now and can also be used on Signet, which is like a new kind of kind of testnet um, where you have the transaction or the blocks uh, signed by trusted party and not by mining. Um, So advantages of Taproot are, this has been discussed a lot, Taproot can improve uh, efficiency and privacy and fungibility um, by hiding the real purpose of an address. So from the outside, you can't really see is this a single SIG, multi-script, or, or even more complex script with Taproot. So this was the big news from March. I'm going to over to most of this because it's really a lot, very technical. So in October, it was, uh, yeah, it was finally merged in October, uh, not in February, sorry. And also um, the usage on Signet was uh, rolled out in October. So uh, <clears throat> in April, um, we saw the new um, pay join protocol 
which basically is a trick to, to shuffle around inputs and outputs um, of a transaction. So you kind of plausibly deny that uh, all the inputs of a, of a transaction belong to you, um, which makes it also more difficult for chain analysis um, to check on the chain um, what are you up to. I would like to say something on page on why it's so amazing, I think. So uh, one, one problem on all the coin join protocols where you have uh, have like maybe 100 parties going into a transaction and 100 parties out of the transaction, if you have uh, different values uh, of coins, then it's easy or it's possible to figure out which incoming coins go, is outgoing to which address, so which address is sending to which address. Uh, so the, the, the simple solution is to have everyone the same. So for example, uh, most of the most of the protocols, for example, like Wasabi Wallet, um, it's 0 0.1 Bitcoin for all transactions. And that's really li limiting and you have to do that uh, beforehand and it makes everything more expensive because you need to coin join and then use it normally. Uh, and the pay, pay join is if you want to buy something from a merchant or you're just paying something. And there are two advantages. First, it's the transaction you're, you, you would do anyways. So there's no additional transaction. And the second amazing thing is um, you're paying some well value maybe 0 0.01 Bitcoin. And, but in the transaction, you can't see what was paid because there's an additional input from the, from, the, from, from the merchant, not only you sending something out, also the merchant sending something out, some random value, and you get your change back and the merchant get paid. But the merchant get paid what you paying, like the zeros, in my example, 0 0.1, uh, zero one, um, and what he puts uh, was putting in, and then you can't can't see that, and so so there are arbitrary values you can use easily, and you 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 pretty much paying not more, and there there are slightly other things that also amazing for the merchant because they they they. Uh, they get get their UTXO set or their their, their unspent output set down, so they have less addresses to say it easily in their wallet, and that makes it cheaper for future transactions. So it's all around amazing. So it's everyone has something out of it. Yeah, that, that's really great. Yeah, thank you for laying this out. Uh, I, I that, this is what I was kind of trying to say was you could you shuffle your input and outputs around, but that was more more clear. Description. <laughs> uh, next up, another feature. Um, there was a proposal for an extension of the BIP32. So the BIP32 is the hierarchical deterministic wallets, which basically is the 24 words, or you can also do 12 words or 15, um, which encodes uh, a, a seed from which you can derive wallets um, for all kinds of, of currencies. So this is extension proposes uh, using this set of entropy to derive another seeds. So you can basically uh, derive another 24 word seeds from this one seed um, by using a derivation pass of one to 10,000, I think. So basically, uh, instead of setting up other 24 seeds by, by rolling the dice or using a random number generator, um, for new wallets, you can just derive from your from your one twenty four word seed, you just have to memorize uh, a single integer as the duration pass of that other wallet you have. Yeah. So this is a cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. Just yesterday, somebody said me, "Oh, I had this wallet I used some time ago, but I don't know where the words is because I was only playing around." And I said, "Oh, it would be amazing if back then this was possible, and you just." have to figure out which derivation path it was, was and you still have yeah, to exactly, yeah. out stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you, you could basically brute force it because there's only 10,000 values to check. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's cool, yeah, for trying around. Yeah, great. So in May, um, we saw some uh, pull requests um, 
improving transaction origin privacy, which basically um, means um, preventing the disclosure of information the moment um, you are transmitting a transaction. There's, there are certain ways to track a back a transaction to your node, um, which you, of course, um, don't want. There's uh, several uh, pull requests um, doing that and um, reaching reaching better privacy. Yeah, I can't, can't s <laughs> I always have a story for that. But uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, be before this, uh, it always was, I don't know the number exactly, but I, I think it was every two hours or so, you know, your note was sending the transaction again that was, uh, was not confirmed. Mm -hmm. So even if it's maybe still in the mempool, it was just uh, broadcasting or t telling the other nodes, oh, there's this transaction. And for a node that is connected to your node, it's 100% clear that that's your transaction because no other node will repeat a transaction if you already source it. And that's every two hours. So it's like, man, it's privacy, like it's it's awful. So, and the first, uh, first improvement was, if I recall right, is, is simply extend the time. Send it after two hours, send it after four hours, after eight or something. I, it's not the exact numbers, but slightly like that, and then uh, more seldom. Because you need to do that, uh, coming back to the mempool, if you're sending a transaction out and it gets out of the mempool because it, uh, the mempool is too big and your transaction is not, uh, uh, the value is not high, high enough that you're paying for it, then um, then you need to rebroadcast it to get finally some time in, uh, in, in a block. So it's needed, but uh, it was too obvious uh, back then. And there are uh, more improvements coming. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I remember that one. I think I think it was uh, it was on the Bitcoin review. It was Amiti. Yeah, did. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. Uh, now, yeah, one more. Chris Belcher uh, showed the prototype software of a of a coin swap, um, which is basically uh, you can uh, trustlessly exchange um, UTXO with someone else. Um, this is also useful for obscuring activity on chain. So we have the first implementation by Chris Belcher again um, to do this on testnet. Um, also, we saw the compact block filters, BIP 157 and 58, uh, which further improve um, the privacy of um, light wallets. Yeah, before we had loom filters um, to obscure what addresses you are asking for. So, example, if you, if you have a light wallet with no full blockchain node, um, your device has to question other full nodes, and it's it's kind of obvious. If from one IP address, there always comes inquiries about certain addresses. Uh, it's possible to link those addresses to that node. So before that, we had the Bloom filters, and now we have the compact block filters, um, which are even better at obscuring um, those requests. Well, yeah. I just activated that stuff yesterday, so it's already uh, in the newest 0 0.21 version of Core. Oh great! Yeah, I, I haven't I haven't got that one yet. So you say you activated it, so it's like a, it's like a switch you have to pull. Uh, you have to activate two config options to have that, and then uh, it it goes back and uh, uh, make that filter for every alt block. So it takes a while, but that's running in the background, no problem. And then uh, you also have to activate. That's one option, and the other option is uh, that you also provide that for the outside. But uh, the next step would be to try some wallet hours out. Uh, I I always think uh, from this pips. I always think about neutrino, but that's that's some some implementation. This is the more general implementation. Uh, so for, for example, uh, I think Wasabi Wallet is using this. So my next task would be trying that out on my on my node. And also also LND should should be possible to use this. Uh, would be also cool running one of your nodes with this block filter, and then you can 
use all your LND nodes safely with that. Yeah. Yeah, great. Sure. And I'm, I'm, I think I should try that uh, later or tomorrow. So uh, next one, um, June, we had uh, the fix of a, of a possible flooding attack of nodes, if I, if I remember correctly. Uh, no, that was later. This was like, this was the overpayment attack on multi-input secret transactions. You could kind of trick trick your hardware wallet to sign a transaction twice, uh, like act like the first one didn't run through, and then actually spend funds twice. Um, so several hardware wallet managers, uh, manufacturers, <coughs> mitigated this by releasing new firmware, and um, yeah, it, it broke some stuff. Um, except for yeah, it, it broke some stuff. Um, on wallets using BIP174 uh, um, partially signed Bitcoin tr transactions. Uh, I, I just want to say one, one yeah. thing to that. Uh, uh, I was not sure if that is really an easy attack that is possible. Uh, so, so you need to do some turn action twice and, and so on. I, I don't know if that really in the wild would fly, let's say. Um, Okay, it's possible, yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I think it's 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 complicated to get get somebody to to really confirm twice the same transaction and so on. I don't know. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Yeah, like those most of these uh, uh, hardware wallet problems, most of them are very very theoretical attacks. Yeah, which first of all uh, need uh, kind of very malicious software running on your computer, so someone has to sneak it there, which actively tricks the user of the hardware wallet. And I think we haven't seen any of this exploded in the wild. Yeah. Yeah. I, I but, mean it, it's it, it's it's possible to do it in practice, but it's not 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 easy executed. So I just wanted to say that because often often there are some bugs and they are blown out of proportion because uh, yeah. Yeah absolutely absolutely I agree. Yeah. There are also some a lot of issues um, this hardware wallet is multi-sig, yeah, most of them. For example, Ledger and Trezor, they have some theoretical problems. The malicious wallet software could trick your trick your funds into a one-of-one -one multi sig with an attacker. So he, he could ransom you or stuff. But but again, this is all very theoretical. Yeah. yeah just just to say, I'm I'm not saying it should be fi shouldn't be fixed. It needs to be fixed. Sure. Yeah. yeah. But uh, it's not like. Like it's a real problem for for the user. It, it will be fixed, and then it's all good. Exactly. Yeah, I, I agree. Perhaps you should add this. This was, of course, a good argument um, for hardware wallets to not um, implement altcoins. But this was also the attack was also possible with just Bitcoin testnet coins. Right, so it's also a funny anecdote, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that that was an attack vector on cold card, one of the very rare attack vectors on cold card, uh, which used uh, Bitcoin testnet. Yeah, that's true. Uh, this okay. This one is one I was getting it. There was a denial of service attack, um, where an attacker could flood a victim's node with inventory or ENV inventory messages, and basically. Kind of choke them and spam them with new transaction announcements, and uh, this was also fixed. I think it looks like it, it was only uh, yeah, it affected Bitcoin and Bitcoin full nodes. Yeah, that's what it says. Uh, so it was fixed by now. Yeah, it was discovered two thousand eighteen, and I think it was also fixed then and it was only disclosed right okay right yeah yeah that was it says yeah okay so, i think yeah so to, to be clear that that attack could have grinded the whole network to a halt or or well would there have been some actions that node <clears throat> operators could have taken to mitigate i'm i'm not aware of any i think this would have been very very critical yeah you have an idea, MZ? 
Mm, I don't know. I think there's no option to to limit that. Uh, I mean, uh, what would happen is uh, your node will crash, but it's only possible for a node that is connected to yours. So you could do manually look which node is exploiting you and ban them, maybe via firewall or via mm -hmm. ban feature in uh, in Bitcoin Core. Uh, yeah, but it, it would be it would have been horrible. For for example, you could ex attack a special node in the network. Uh, yeah, it's bad. This time, this is for sure a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, this was the end of my part. I think July uh, MZ takes over. Okay. Let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, I switched to August to, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, to get it a little bit faster done. Uh, okay, the first one on August is um, the VIP uh, 325 verification. That's for Signet and uh, I think we slightly said something about uh, Signet before, but we'll get a little bit deeper into what it is. Um, uh, sometimes you need need to need some uh, test something out that is really out on the network. So maybe multi parties are involved and so on, um, and you can't use rec test. Rec test is uh, if you, if you run run a node, uh, the whole mining protocol is not running then, and you can simply. Uh, say mine and get a new block on your local node, and uh, sometimes sometimes that's enough to test something. But sometimes you need more people involved and have it really running on a network. And there's the test net, and the test net that's around for like forever. Um, but the test net has problems because uh, sometimes people spam uh, spam it, and, and uh, on the test net and the sick net. And also the reckness for sure. The, the the coins they are worth nothing on there. So you can simply mine them, but nobody will give you money for it. So it's just for testing out. And you can ask somebody, for example, you can ask me and I will give you some test net coins. That's not another problem. Or signet coins. So uh, hit me <laughs> if you need some. Uh, they are free. So um but test net the problem was uh sometimes a miner would try something out. And then the difficulty will arise on the test net. And then the miner has has everything running and moves to mainnet or whatever, and the miner is gone, and then, then the network is stuck for like a long time. I think there was some something switched that this, that's not so much a concern, but uh, pretty much the network is uh, is not really good for testing the test net. So the signet was uh, was uh, created. And now it's also running. <laughs> there, there are exactly two people who has uh, have a key and they can sign a block. They they need a little bit proof of work, but uh, they also need to to sign a block. And uh, only if they sign the block, then on this public uh, on the normal public signet, they are valid. So it's like two people controlling it more or less the mining, the mining part. Um, not that they can steal coins or so as, as in the mainnet, the miner can't, can't do. Um, but you can also run your own signet if you like, and you sign the blocks. Um, it's simply a better testnet. And uh, it's already running a few hundred blocks deep, thousands, I don't know. Um, but uh, for like two months or so, it's running. and. Um, there was something about ah, uh, and the taproot um, is all already activated there. So, so there, there, there was no activation needed because simply in the code there it states um, taproot is activated for for the whole network since genesis of uh, of the signet. Um, so you can also already do taproot transactions there, and that's something I will try out. Um, and what's in Bitcoin Core missing is the activation mechanism for the mainnet. But everything else is in place and runs already on Signet, and we can try it out. So what's the difference between Signet and Liquid? 
and liquid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think the, the obvious simplest uh, difference is that the signet coins are worth nothing. <laughs> yeah. Them, so, uh, yeah, but why? Because there's nothing you can send a Bitcoin to to get the signet coin. Hmm. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thousands of other altcoins too, so <laughs> that are worth something for whatever reason. <laughs> I mean, on the, on the testnet, it always was stated that if the testnets, I, I think that uh, we, we are on testnet number three, not signet, testnet. That, that's uh, the, the, the really uh, normal testnet where you need proof of work, like on the mainnet. And so it was two times resetted because somebody was selling. Uh, I think once uh, it was worth something, and then <laughs> exactly. they get it. Uh, so uh, I think on Zetnet, a Signet, it's the same. If if somebody will will, will get paid, and and uh, if the notion that Signet coins worth something, then we just reset it and have a new thing. Um, and and how <laughs> and how was it resetted? How was it reset resetted? The Zetnet. Uh, yeah, I have no idea. Yeah. You just you just start off with zero and say okay, new chain. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I I don't know how it how it was, but I can explain a little bit how how you would do it. <laughs> you simply uh, generate a new genesis block, and if nodes um, talk to each other, they will figure out that uh, even if it's the same port number where they're doing the peer-to-peer -peer protocol, they will figure out, oh, that's not the same genesis block, that's another network. Yeah. So do a new genesis block and then you're good to go. Yeah. Okay, somebody can still run the old one. I presume, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My question yeah. is if it can interfere in some way that. <clears throat> no, no, because yeah. there's this magic that is sent and that uh, that somehow is related or a hash or something of the of the Genesis block. So the Genesis block is somehow in the peer-to-peer -peer network uh, connected. Yeah, okay. Not exactly 100% sure how it is, but if you have another uh, Genesis block, then you can't connect. To the node. Yeah. Okay. The next one is a little bit really technical. I had I had to look it up a little bit. Um, uh, for Lightning, it's sometimes important that you get uh, um, bump a fee on. <laughs> it's it's really involved. Um, bump a fee on a transaction. And something you can do is uh, child pays for parent. This is this CPFP. So another, the second transaction that you make is, uh, is connected to the first one, so the child. And the child can raise the transaction fee for both. And there's some attack that is possible to prevent that that's pos uh, that's uh, that it is possible to use um, child pays for parent, and there was a was a change in the Bitcoin Core um, behavior that uh, you can have uh, so called anchor outputs, and that's a possibility to stop um, um, a malicious party to attempt uh, this so called transaction pinning where you can't use uh, Use the fee bumping via child pays for parent. Yeah, I don't know. It's really technical, <laughs> but it's an improvement that was needed in the base layer to improve the Lightning network. And it's it's not a consensus uh, change or anything. It's it's just how the mempool works, and the mempool is not really um, um, that relevant for for consensus because consensus is only about the Mostly only about the blocks. Um, okay. So in 2011, <laughs> that's way back, um, a Bitcoin contributor, uh, Hal Finney, said he is dead now, he, he died, but uh, he described a method by G uh, Gallat, 
Lambert and Whenstone, GLV called, um, to reduce, uh, uh, reduce the number of expensive comp uh, computations needed to verify Bitcoin transaction signatures. So it's a, it's a, it's an improvement that, that the signature validation is a little bit uh, faster. And uh, he claimed that it's about 25%. Uh, the only problem was there was a US patent on that uh, speed increasement, but the patent was, um, uh, was, uh, has expired on September 25th, uh, 2020, and within a month, the code was merged into Bitcoin Core, and now it's 25% faster. So there are slight, <laughs> slightly uh, improvements. So if you sync your node, it's a little bit faster again. Yeah, little steps, always little improvements. So yeah, back to patents, <laughs> also in September. Uh, Square announced that they uh, made a foundation, the a Currency Open Patent Alliance, COPA, <laughs> um, to pull uh, patents from them. Uh, that's, that's the thing that uh, often happens like uh, in big companies, like for example, like Intel and AMD, they share patents and then they, they just uh, have less problems and can, uh, can uh, faster innovate stuff. And uh, I think it's a good thing. You can't, I think somehow you, you, you have to play in the legal system. And uh, I don't like patents that much, but uh, there are patents, and then you have to play by the rules. Yeah, there are 18 members, many, many known exchanges and uh, yeah, companies in the in the field. So it's, uh, I think it's good to have that. So the next one. We are still at September. No, we are in October and October. <clears throat> so five years after the SegWit proposal. Um, yeah, there, 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 there was a problem. So in, in old clients or the old addresses that starts with a one, there is an easy feature to sign a message. So to prove that you have the private key to this address uh, most wallets have that feature, but for uh, the addresses with a three up front, that's uh, pay to script hash addresses. Um, there's no easy way to do that because uh, it could be a multi sig, and then there's not um, there there's no easy way, or there was no standard to do that uh, on on that addresses. And uh, the fix for that also for all SegWit addresses because uh, they they also uh, yeah it simply only worked on the addresses with the one on up front the old legacy addresses and um, to fix that they put out a standard that will do a virtual so-called virtual transaction that is not really valid on a on a, on the mainnet but. It's a valid transaction that you can see that uh, that it would be possible for this address to be spent by this person. So um, and it also also works on hardware wallet with the PSBT um, standard. So that's a good improvement because uh, sometimes you need to prove that you own an address. And uh, there should be a standard. Okay, then also in October, uh, a new version of the message uh, was introduced. Uh, this ADD, ADDR address is um, for the peer to peer network to figure out which other IP addresses. Uh, running Bitcoin core, so to find another node. So when you connect, the other node will tell you if you 
addresses there are also so-called feeler, um, feeler connections where you only connect uh, out, ask for new addresses, and get over this uh, this protocol message new addresses, new IP addresses where nodes are running, and then you can try them out and uh, connect to them. Um, and um, uh, the address format was was a 20, uh, 128 bit address field for every address, even even IP for uh, 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 version four that, that the smaller was used in this address format. But the problem is that some addresses are longer, and the first where the problem uh, was coming up is uh, is the new hidden services from um, from Tor, the Tor Onion services. They uh, have a new version. This is the version three. <laughs> it's a little bit. Uh, so the, the address format message is uh, version two, the new one. And the new hidden services is the version three. And the version three is a really long address, 265 bits. It's a, you simply see if you use Tor and you connect to a hidden service that it's a really long, uh, really long. Um, Letters and uh, and numbers address and doesn't fit in the in the old format, so they brought us the new version that can support that. And it's a little bit com complicated. I think we have we it's integrated in the zero dot. Uh, so so in January, just just a few days ago, the zero dot twenty one version of Bitcoin Core was out and. Uh, there it's included, but it took like five release candidates. Not only because of that, there was other 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 problems, but uh, also this um, killed other nodes. <laughs> For example, the Java implementation of um, um, for Bitcoin uh, was crashing. This addresses, so it uh, wasn't good. There needed to be some adjustments. But now now it's out, and you can use. Uh, this new hidden services, and uh, that's a good thing because uh, the old version two onion services they will uh, discontinued in January this year. So it's a needed change, and also another another protocols will will be supported. For example, in the future, for example, I two P, that's another uh, privacy protocol like Tor. Okay, we are in November. Um, yeah, for November the uh, the lightning nail. I, I think we we had it on the on this list of the twenty twenty four most influential uh, companies. It was announced there that uh, they put out Lightning Pool, the Lightning Pool marketplace. Uh, as I said before, it's just a, um, it, not just it's it's a cool thing to um, buy incoming LED channels. And that's really needed because if you if you are a merchant and you need incoming capacity, then somehow you need to get it. And that's a cool marketplace and uh, yeah. Okay, December, last month. Um, Uh, what was that? Ellen offers the ability for a spending node to request the invoice from receiving node over the onion routed LN network. Yeah, so 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 um, this is a really often requested feature because um, in the legacy system you often have something where you have reoccurring uh, payments, like for example you. Uh, yeah, you, you have a VPN or so, and you renew it every month. Then somehow it needs to be automated, and not you. You have to do it manually all the time and paying Lightning invoices. And um, so the LN protocol was uh, uh, had has now the ability to uh, request payments from the other side, pay uh, pay it. And I think. Somehow it needs to be uh, in all the all the Lightning Wallet 
implementations uh, mostly in, in in clients you use on a phone or so that you can have some option to say okay this node uh, can do that and or, or you do every month uh, request a new invoice and it's auto re renewed i think that's really needed but uh, i haven't seen it uh, apart from uh, it says here it's implemented in the C Lightning implementation. Um, oh, it's oh, what was merged. Okay, merged. Uh, it's in there, but uh, I haven't tried it. Okay, so that's so far the Optech newsletter um, year review of twenty twenty. <laughs> What's next? I think that was the finance part. Michael, you want to do it? I want to do it, okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, I thought. I thought <laughs> uh, then let me dig it up. <clears throat> um, what was it? It's not working on moment. <clears throat> I think this is also the last, last part, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I, think so. yeah. Uh, I think so. <laughs> yeah, running at two hours now. Yeah. Okay, as long as uh, Michael is figuring stuff out, I have some additional stuff to show. <laughs> All right. Yeah, uh, you can go ahead. Just, uh, just, just to show that because I think it's an amazing website to, uh, as, as a resource. Uh, Jameson Lop has on his website um, lop.net. He has this uh, Bitcoin resources and he's really collecting like everything you can imagine. <laughs> so yeah, like podcasts, blogs, books, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was just I was just going to agree. It's really incredible. He's got resources on everything. Yeah. He's been collecting links and stuff for like a long time now. Yeah. So so it's amazing. Uh I think it, it it's so much you really have to uh but but it's it also on topic. So maybe you're looking for block explorers and then you have a list, list of block explorers. So yeah. And you also have the same for the Lightning Network. And it's also ex also so much stuff. Uh, yeah, so Explorers, again, for the Lightning Network, Explorers, podcasts, blogs, everything. So yeah, amazing resource, lob.net, and then Bitcoin resources and Lightning resources. So, Michael, you ready or have to feel something else? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's sharing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Paul Tudor Jones is apparently one of the major uh, investors. Um, and that was a major news that he. Um, that he bought Bitcoin as a hedge against inflation. That is also what I guess um, um, sparked the rally that we saw. Um, one of the um, <clears throat> points where it was really then going up over the year. Um, that's, that's just just a few short links, um, and then there was this interest in, in um, the futures, we see in Bitcoin futures hitting an all-time high. Um, and um, we had, of course, this news about Grail scale and, and MicroStrategy getting into Bitcoin and um, 
that was as said it, uh, like like the build up um to the Elon Musk tweet right that we already mentioned MC so I just wanted to show uh, or the narrative how it um, was building up all this momentum over the year and of course um, one major website that came up in the year is Bitcoin treasuries there's an article about it bitcointreasuries.org that it really became a thing um, that more and more big uh, companies even companies that are not in the Bitcoin or blockchain space um, are starting to consider Bitcoin as part of their treasury so that's what this website looks like and I wanted to maybe have a little discussion of what people think in contrast with the news we saw with in March with uh, the crash of Bitcoin when it crashed down to 4,000 because all the institutional investors sold it off and then they're buying again so what's your opinion is this will what the will there are the weekends and will they sell again when there's a little when, the, when, the, when there's a little the next crisis or do you think they will hold again or does this overall contribute a lot to the proverbial bitcoin volatility um what do you think I think the evangelism of Michael Saylor um, as an investor and um, especially also the playbooks that he shared on how to buy it and how to do it and um, is very convincing and uh, I think it will have a lasting effect um, and many many investors came in after after him and um, and also most mostly came in silently there was not a lot of fuss about it and I think um, if, if you've listened to Michael Saylor and the way he talks about it, um, he, he and if you believe him, he intends to never sell. So um, he's he's in for the long game. And um, all those that are, have come in um, might um, in his well attracted through him and convinced by him um, might be in it for similar reasons. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a financial expert or whatever, but uh, what I heard or some people said is um, if a company decides to buy Bitcoin as a, for, for their treasury, it's not like they, 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 they on a whim or say, oh, buy something and then, oh, if, if I don't like it anymore and then I sell like, like, like a retail, retail uh, investor, they, they they will look and oh, it's falling. I will sell and then buy some other stuff. But uh, I think a company they 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 will buy it and then hold it for at least one year or longer, even longer, because they made a decision to do this. And even if it's false and then they are in the negative, they I think they did a decision up front to stay in it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that too. I think uh, so. Institutionals are, are a lot less weak hands than than retail. I think the retail rally in twenty seventeen uh, was really bad. Yeah, we saw a very rapid spike and then it collapsed. Everybody got out. It was really extreme. So this this time it wasn't that bad. I think that's the general consensus. As soon as you've got institutionals in there, you've got less weak hands and you've got less severe drops. Yeah. Speaking of which, we are we are still down almost 30 percent from all-time high now uh now make it 25 but still it's uh, it's a huge drop i don't know I, I i i personally don't speculate too much on price i think on the long term uh, we, we still have orders of magnitude to go and i don't worry about the short term too much uh, as, as i don't engage in trading i think it's a waste of time so i think on the long term uh we are in for yeah still still massive massive gains 
against the fiat currencies. I'm, I'm quite convinced about that. And that's all I, I'm thinking about, basically. Yeah, I, I forgot one uh, important point. One important point is, uh, except of Michael's strategy, all the other companies companies all only uh, converting a fraction of their treasury into Bitcoin. It's not like they trans uh, um, buying all with all that cash they have. So they, they only have like a four small fractions, maybe a percent, maybe 10% of their treasury in, uh, in, in Bitcoin. So if it's going up or down, it's like, okay, it's, it's not much. It's not like, like they, they see the, they don't see the 25% on the whole treasury. They see maybe 1% because Bitcoin is down and something else is not down or up or whatever. So Yeah, true. Absolutely. Uh, no, no one is as crazy as Michael Seller. Actually, I'm not quite sure how you pulled this off. I mean, he, he, he doesn't personally own the company, right? He's the founder and CEO. But I think there's there's probably other investors who would have to agree on this. It, it still looks like a very reckless move, kind of endangering the whole operation, even even for me, who is a huge, uh, huge Bitcoin advocate. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure a lot of companies would do that the same. Oh. So, so he needs a reckless, uh, reckless head. I absolutely, he, he absolutely deserves a reckless head. Can't get more reckless than that. But it played out nicely for him. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess he's the majority um, shareholder. So, so you can actually um, decide on this. Okay. As far okay. as I remember, so nobody else has basically any say. But, right. but I guess um, what's interesting is, um, I mean. If, if he has a company that did um, um, that that did IT stuff, right? I mean, if if he do, if he doesn't if he doesn't know how to grow his business from from there, because he would have he would need a plan to expand in other areas, and and maybe he believes he just that, that there isn't there isn't anything better than Bitcoin right now, um, so. Or what? What's your opinion on that? Sorry, I, I didn't get it. Yeah, no, no, normally you're expected to expand your business with your with the reserves and your treasuries and um, and but but I mean we have we have discussions in society where to. Where, where where to grow or where to innovate and uh, we have we have cheap cheap interest rates and um, and uh, everything is, is is in a bubble right so it's not easy to ex expand a business in a meaningful way maybe yeah that's absolutely true I think I think that money you converted into Bitcoin at first it was only his cash reserves yeah he had some some cash sitting there and he said okay I'm not going to to watch it depreciate duplicate every year for like five ten percent I need some, something stronger and then he kind of changed his mind and collected more more dollars to convert to Bitcoin and I'm, I'm not quite sure I think his his main business is cloud computing cloud storage yeah I mean how, how do you expand there yeah you, you build more servers yeah. To do what? more networking centers, and uh, I think I think it's just his cash reserves he want to want to protect from inflation, at least in the beginning. Now now it kind of feels like he's he's converted the company into a Bitcoin ETF, basically, like a covered Bitcoin ETF, because yeah, the, the stock price of his company will kind of go parallel with Bitcoin from now on. And actually, yeah, I'm I'm not really sure uh, what he's up to. I mean, as a Bitcoin, I applaud this. I applaud the positive press about it, but still, it's a very reckless move, and I, I don't really understand it from a you know, from a company management point of view. Um, as I as I follow the story, I think he he convinces board with a very personal and very very convincing story, and that is he he already. So I I tried to pull it off my head, but I. Yes, it was like he once was in a country where the currency completely implode and he and he lost within a day a, um, a lot of his assets, a lot of his value, trying to get somehow out of country. 
and and he tried try, already tried to get a boat to get anything out of country and that was a very personal story for him and maybe he is sensitized um, of possibilities in that way it's a very personal story yeah that's that's true but but still i mean this his business proposition is like building building clouds yeah and uh, making money by that and not holding bitcoin so i'm not quite yeah. sure about that it's not the core business. Sorry? It's not the core business. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what, what you normally do as a company, uh, as, a, as a listed company, you just buy back your own stocks with the money. And then uh, everyone who's holding the stocks, uh, the stocks will go up because they are, there's demand on the buy side because of that. Uh, but he, I think he also said uh, that's, that then all my liquid assets and in in my, my, all my liquid money in the, in the company is gone. And if I if I have overnight a nice idea to do something, then I I I, I, I again have to sell my stocks or what? Uh, so or I have to um, have have to get new new money on the on the on this for my for my company. So so he said no, I I, I want to be liquid. I don't. I don't know. So that that was uh, his explanation. So he want to have that money if if he needs it for something, and he doesn't want to uh, buy his stocks back. But uh, as we see, the stock is up, and he has the money. So win win. <laughs> yeah, win win. Yeah, that's true. I think we will all keep an eye on on it on this on this company. See what he does in the future. He yeah. really put himself uh, on, on the Bitcoiners radar now because I, I wasn't aware of that company before. I, I hadn't heard about it yet. So to, to, to get exposure to uh, crypto, is it better to invest in uh, micro strategy or directly by Bitcoin? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think, I think if you are, for example, if you are an investment fund or something, you are managing other people's money, it's kind of difficult for you to, to buy Bitcoin directly. So right. This might be a chance to get Bitcoin exposure into your funds. There's a good proxy and in yeah. term also quite liquid and everybody can understand. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe my yeah, it's a, like a proxy 80% of yeah, okay. That's what I thought. It's better than the great skill. Agreed. This uh, this ETF or open end fund, right? This yeah, great. exactly. It's it's like yeah. a Bitcoin ETF now, some people say. And I think there's some truth to it. Yeah, certainly. Okay, does anybody else have something to add? <clears throat> Can also be a more general question. If you still want to contribute something on the record, then please go ahead. 